Five minutes, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I shouldn't mute myself. <laughs> Hi, Manny. Okay, cool. Hi, everyone. Um, oh, 
Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're going well. Okay. Hi, everyone, and thank you all for coming to this celebration of the life of Mark Fisher called No More Miserable Monday Mornings, hosted by myself and Alex, myself being Lucy, if you didn't know. Um, first of all, I want to start by doing a welcome uh, acknowledgement of country. Um, I'd like to acknowledge. Sorry. <laughs> I acknowledge the Wandry people of the Kulin nations and pay my respects to the elders past and present. This always has and always will be Indigenous land. Um, part of the reason why I think it's so important to start like a conversation about post capitalism with an acknowledgement of country is because obviously, like Indigenous groups of this, of this country have been here for hundreds of thousands of years and capitalism is a small, tiny blight in that era. So we want to find something, some alternative, then that might be a decent place to start. Um, cool, so the basic structure of the event is just Alex and I are gonna be having a little chat. Um, why we've elected ourselves to this will probably come evident, hopefully. Um, and it'll be about 45 minutes and then we'll have about 45 minutes for discussion. So if there's anything you wanna talk about, anything like, that you feel like we have raised, um, feel free to do so. Um, I also feel like it might be worth just raising a content warning for depression, just because we all know like that Mark Fisher and a lot of his work is centered around depression. And I figured like as much as like people are probably very aware coming into that, I just want to put the warning out there. <laughs> okay. That and suicide. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But just like um so. Well, first bit, I'm just going to ask Alex, is like, how did you find Fisher's work and like, how do you do your relationship to it? Okay, um, so I moved, I found myself in London in 2009. Um, and I don't know, he, um, uh, so I was, I was squatting um, and he's quite a well uh, regarded figure within a lot of leftist, anarchist, syndicate circles, that kind of thing. Um, by just as a frame of reference um, in London at the time. So 2010, which is when I started university, we've got the student protests, 2011, London riots, and then into Occupy. So, um, and, and he's kind of a figure floating around at this time. Um, uh, like, I, I can't remember actually when Capitalist Realism was published, but like his, his blog was super well known. Um, the university I went to would have the anarchist book fair and like some of his stuff would be printed in zine forms like sometimes I think without his consent but um uh, so it was yeah kind of this um uh character um I've been in a room with him a few times I've never actually spoken with him um and he taught a lot of my friends at Goldsmiths um uh when when like later on when he was there in like 2016 onwards um and uh yeah it was just um i think uh the first introduction properly that i had um was a, a partner of mine who um is also a massive drake fan <laughs> <laughs> i don't know how much work is it but but had um and, and is from south africa and had uh been reading um k punk as as like before he moved to london something like trying to understand the culture and the references and um, it took me to see Mark talk in Shoreditch. I can't remember all the details, um, but uh, yeah, it was like a sort of an, a, a well-respected figure that was understood as a kind of new, new wave, new genre sort of thing of like uh, intellectual London um, or British uh, cultural theory. Um, Basically, that's, that's, that's how I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's cool. It's like, almost like the inverse of like, I found Mark Fisher like via the internet, which is kind of rather fitting, I think. Yep. It's like I was reading and um, I think like I knew he existed for a while, which is because by being on Twitter and on like the internet. The name and, comes like, up. The name comes up. And particularly if you like follow like leftist stuff. Um, and then I read an article by British philosopher and writer Tom Wyman about um, gifted kid syndrome. This was like before it became really cringy to talk about gifted kid syndrome. But like he had this like quite lengthy quote from capitalist realism that was about, that was just like, oh, no, that, that's the shit. Like that's, <laughs> that read, like it resonated so much. I was like, well, I'm going to have to read this book. And then 
went and found the PDF and read it like in a couple of in two days and was like holy shit like this is it was just like this not even like a revelation it was just like putting like the alienation I was feeling in like my third year of uni academia being the worst place in the world and then like seeing that like talked about properly and then yeah and then from that I watched the um lectures the DOCH lectures which are pretty popular on YouTube um and then I just kind of was like at this point like I think you can generally find Mark Fisher pretty easily at readings now but like at that point like I think like I had the special order everything in and then I think when K the K-Punk collected works got published I found it in readings and I was like holy shit and like bought it immediately even though it was like 70 dollars um and yeah and then um I wrote my honours thesis on Mark Fisher um and Heidegger which is a weird combo which if people want me to talk about I can at length um, <laughs> But she's, she's the academic. Yeah. <laughs> so, unfortunately. Um, yeah. Um, so I figured like our next transition would be like, what is like the work that's most resonated with you or like your favorite Mark Fisher work? Um okay. So uh my my answer to that is like maybe um something that he's very, very well known for, which is the first chapter of Ghost of Ghost of My Life, the slow cancellation of the future. Um, which is uh, in within that book is kind of his um, explanation of how things are or were are happening at the time, um, and and then he goes on for the rest of the book to give a whole bunch of like really amazing um, uh, kind of uh, culturally relevant to his theories art critiques like talks about joy division talks about um <coughs> oh there, there's so many references anyway it's like you know half half book um but i think uh for me like and there's so many other little tiny like weird little projects like podcasts that he did um which is like called like haunted land or lost land or something but there's all these lovely beautiful little almost art installation type things that he's done but that particular um the slow cancellation of the future resonated with me because I think it was um, uh, not something I'd ever considered um, un un until I read that, but something that is so obviously apparent once you understand it, because my understanding is that you look at um, time through art and, and that you're um, judging this, the linear progression of things maybe oh that's a glitch that's very appropriate um, <laughs> it's just lang um just keep going okay <laughs> um okay cool uh yeah so you know um like uh, if for those of you who maybe aren't familiar with it it's something that you uh, sorry, he had he has a, a wonderful sentence, uh, line, phrase, whatever theory. Um, that's like if you took a piece of jungle music, so you know, like sort of rave music from the early '90s in the UK, um, and played it to someone in 1985, they'd be like, "What the fuck is this? Like, how do I deal with it?" But this is where music is going. This is so completely out of what I would have expected. I maybe have these ideas of the future, but this is completely outside of the ideas that I had generated that far. Whereas if you did the same equivalent thing with a record now or 10 years ago, um, they'd just be like, oh yeah, cool, who's that? Like, <laughs> I don't really care. It doesn't impress me and it doesn't um, shock my sense of, of temporal belonging to an era or epoch or a period or something like that. And, um, you know, so like, I don't know, for, for reference like I'm 31 um <laughs> but it's uh you know like uh, so, like when I moved to London there was heaps 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 of uh you know like raves free um party scene that was still going on but it's not like what he's talking about and I've met many 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 people that were of that era and have since like travelers especially that kind of thing who have left the UK specifically maybe even moved to Spain uh because the culture of rave which and you know jungle was a large part of that kind of thing um was you know in in the same way that you could say like as a singular specific substance mdma brought so many people together at a time who had no other um relational 
I don't know, ways of interacting. Um, and, and this rave space, this mass cultural movement would be where these dispersed groups and identities would come together and have something that was a shared collective, you know, maybe ecstatic experience. Um, and uh, which is something that, you know, he, he never ex uh, dis explicitly discusses, but I know from people that I know he was, you know, in, in and around and, uh, you know, uh rave wise but it's like um i think the slow cancellation of the future in as a, as a concept um which is obliquely about this cultural malaise depression it comes to it from a point of view of that we're not necessarily as creators or as people that can consume art or whatever um uh, like you know given up on the concept or, or disinterested in making new things but the uh overwhelming uh production capitalist sort of you know you know machine or you know if, i mean goldsmith is is an excellent uh, example perhaps where he taught um for those of you who don't know it's like you know if you want to get a career in art you need to go to royal college um, of arts you need to go to goldsmith from that you might get like headhunted you might have a graduation show this is like one of the ways that you get into the art world it's um you know even as a musician you know as, as a noise musician or something which is like such an underground current um when he's talking about rave culture and has then sort of become uh d d distorted within the sense of of reproducing these sounds and images which are either commercially viable or, or nostalgic or comforting because people realize the slight um uh, like variations uh, as opposed to perhaps like a I don't know, weird new wave <laughs> um yeah and so i mean it's, it's a really it's a really um i mean the book the book is about ghosts um hauntology like you know which you obviously borrowed from derrida but it's uh it's it's very it's very personal and it's very um I think it's quite sad. It's, it's one of his sadder books. It doesn't have like the political uh, fervor, perhaps, of, of capitalist realism or definitely acid communism. Um, you know, it's it's it is a bit um, like he's writing a lot about nostalgia, and within that, in himself, he's being nostalgic for things that didn't eventuate. And you know, uh, kn knowing like his history um, uh, with the CCIU, it's like you know, and or anyone that was maybe um, really interested in what the internet was potentially going to bring and living in Britain um, at the time in the 90s, uh, you know, it, it is it is kind of, um, disheartening, because you have to let a lot of things ide ideologically um, float onwards as, as opposed to going anywhere, um, which I think, uh, you know, like you would say he's in one form or another a communist and it's not something that he's ever given up on i think right to his like last things ever written he's really serious about that and um you know as he's writing a lot of the things that he's writing there's an absolute understanding um that that just didn't work it's dead it's gone um and it's uh, you know something that can't maybe be revived because we're stuck in a loop uh that, that that isn't progressing culturally i mean and that you know maybe this can speak to this like so much better but um like you know with the um the, the frankfurt school and and i mean even like criticisms because that about like cultural marxism that's kind of just you know in, inching along towards um nothingness really <laughs> um it, it, it's it's yeah it's, it's it's very beautiful but it's a bit of a bleak like thing that I've, I've chosen to, 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 to pick up on your your favorite Fisher. Sure. Yeah, I was just thinking about um, what I like stuck with me in the slow translation in the future was like the example of the Arctic monkeys, just because like being like for me it's one house. Yeah, same. Because <laughs> like I was like a teen on Tumblr, so of course I loved Arctic monkeys. Like, still love them, and I find it really interesting just because like it never clicked for me before. It's like oh wait, no, that's just like it is like this weird like not nostalgia nostalgia for like and then like if you look at like the album is like later records it seems to be like progressing in time but like 
not because like they're like newest albums like this weird kind of like I would like I don't know the art rock is the thing but like it's an artistic rock album that sounds like it should have been done and like I'm very bad with like cultural stuff but like like the 70s or the 80s is like and then they just like released it then and there was nothing like oh we're doing like a throwback it's just like oh Alex Turner's being a bit creepy like <laughs> being a bit weird yeah no I mean I think he at some point goes into really explicit details like um the the way I don't know if any of you can remember it, but it's shot in black and white, and it's shot specifically like um, there's a television program in Britain that would play new music on a fucking Friday night or something, and it's shot exactly like it was in that style. Like it's it, you know it's more than a homage; it's kind of a spatial ripoff. Like I don't know, it, and it's it's not deliberately targeted to be. Um, yeah, from anywhere or anything, but for people that grew up watching that, that uh, you know, British people would be like, yeah, that's what that looks like. That that's what that is. No, no, it was um, it was a, a weird grey whistle. Grey whistle. Great. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> um, yeah, I guess I probably should talk about um my favorite work or the work I think it said the most influence on me, which is um, like the unfinished introduction to acid communism, which the context, um, this was the project he was working on at the time of his death. Um, you see it reflected in his like last lectures that he gave at Goldsmiths were published under um, post-capitalist desire. And they're like really interesting because it's like, it's just him battling a bunch of like art students to try and make them more hopeful. <laughs> like that, that is the vibe of it. And it's just like, there's like a weird like cognitive thing of just like, huh? But like, and then acid communism was like, the work he was trying to produce out of studying like not just like going back to like like critical theory theorists like um leotard and he says like explicitly not to lose in Qatari, but it's clear that they're in the frame because i don't think you can do much in like this idea of like a post-capitalism des desire and like the combination of marx and freud without touching on um like anti at least mm. um but yeah, um, I'm just going to read a quote from Acid Communism. Um, if you've ever talked to me, I've probably read this quote out to you before. It's one of my favourite things in the world. And I think, yeah, it was just like a moment of epiphany. It was just like, oh, yeah, no, this is okay. And this is from like the very beginning of the book. He has a long quote from um, Marcuse from Eros and Civilization, And then he goes into this, which is um, the claim of this book is that the last 40 years have been about exercising the spectre of the world which could be free. Adopting the perspective of such a world allows us to reverse the emphasis of so much recent left-wing struggle. Instead of seeking to overcome capital, we should focus on what capital must always obstruct, the collective capacity to produce, care and enjoy. We on the left have had it wrong for a while. It is not that we are anti-capitalist. It is that capitalism with all its visored cops, its tear gas, and all its theological niceties of its economics is set up to uh, block the emergence of this red plenty. The overcoming of capital has to be fundamentally based on the simple insight that far from being about wealth creation, capital necessarily and always blocks the production of common wealth. Yeah, like that. It's just, I think it's like, I know it's like a very, very good articulation of so much of like how we need to understand what capitalism does. And I think it like ties really well into like to returning to capitalist realism. And I see like Alex's point about these being the two politically charged texts and then Soy Cancellation of the Future and Ghost of My Life is kind of this weird, like, I don't want to say inert, but like <laughs> yeah. it's got that kind of vibe. Um, it's just very personal, wasn't it? Yeah. And like it's him just kind of like wanting to return to like, well, he like, he talks about what happened in like the student movements of the 60s and 70s and how counterculture fits into that and particularly like psychedelic, like hippie culture. And as much as like hippie culture sucked and was like ultimately like co-opted by capitalism, it was like, there was a point in it of just like thinking about things differently. And the idea that like that happens in the collective, like it's, you're very high somewhere and you talk to someone you have a conversation and it's just like the conversation engagement with someone else will 
change your perspective slightly. And I think that's like a really crucial thing, like, and it's the bare basis of like, I know why, why I actively call myself a communist is it's about the communal thing, the bubble else. And yeah, it's also like, I mean, like, I know people like shy away from having any like arguing there's any like inherent structure to being also like I don't because I'm a Heideggerian <laughs> but <laughs> um there's like I think like it's people are like inherently social it is built into the like fundamental foundation of being in yeah, a way shit goes wrong we all collectivize yeah and I it's know. like and like we need to understand that like the most like pervasive and like actively criminal thing about capitalism is that it turns you into an individual that is disconnected from everyone and that's why like I also quite like um like exiting the vampire castle because here's the point is that like identitarianism will get us nowhere like and if we like don't try to be like fix like try and create like connections between other people then we're fucked <laughs> I think, I mean, I think I felt like the, I mean, you know, um, so he also, uh, so he had a very, very difficult time for a very long time getting published. No one was interested. Um, he was a high school teacher, um, college is like year 11 or 12, um, you know, and didn't have, uh, like, I mean, part of the emphasis on, on blogging culture was that, you know, these are often like minor academics or, or people that just like didn't have other channels of publishing what they were thinking and feeling that was interesting. And, um, you know, for him, he has, uh, and, and I know this from people that have studied under him, he has so much time for people and your questions and your queries. And, you know, if you turned up to a class or, you know, wanted to email him from his blog, that kind of thing, like he, he was actually, he was, he was very, very good at, 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 um, not only uh, not making you feel like an idiot because <laughs> he's like intensely intelligent like and the way that he writes is is very accessible because he, he really wants that to be for the people that you can understand anyone can pick it up and understand things but you know there's not that many people that could like casually give you like a four sentence uh, you know like rundown of, of like what the thousand plateaus but he could yeah, you see. It's like whoa, <laughs> you know, you're 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 a very subtle genius, <laughs> but but that he had time for, for for people and their questions and wanted and you know they say like argumentative students, but he he would let them argue. He would, um, uh, you know, and 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 I mean, I I haven't actually ever been to a uh, university in, in Australia, but like in general. Um, you know, I, I did notice a difference um, from the two times I did go to university in the UK, which was like uh, sort of prime his time and then after after he passed. Um, and uh, there was a kind of slight hierarchical softening. Um, I mean, maybe perhaps I just also didn't go to the best universities for most. Um, <laughs> but it's, uh, I did um <laughs> but it's uh yeah it's it's um really 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 important to be able to have conversations about um culture theory and politics and music and art with the people that you know and trust the most in terms of cultural theory you know and it's it's something that i think he treasured very deeply was was talking to people and being accessible yeah and i think like relating to like my experience with the australian institutions um, I'm not going to shit talk a certain university that is very <laughs> close geographically to here. I'm not as close as one other one, but there's one that's like slightly further away. Um, but like, I think like the only time I've experienced that is in student run reading groups mm. or like in a particular class that I had, which was a critical theory class. Um, and like, it's because like the teacher was amazing. And like every lesson, this was like in the middle of lockdown in 2020, she was like, she was just so angry because it, she like came from Germany and was like, I've been like quarantined. It's like all this stuff. And she's got like friends who were stuck in this overseas. And she was just every lesson was stuck for rant about this and like go off. <laughs> this is so good. But like, it was just like a communal building. It was just like, and like, maybe it's just because like, I really like critical theory 
that could be it. So it's like an engagement. And then like I've made like some of my best friends I've made in that class. And it's weird to think that, oh, I met you in like a Zoom tutorial. But then it's also like with student run reading groups, like I'm also very lucky to be facilitating the book club at NIBS. And I found that really productive because it's specifically a non-institutional engagement with texts. And I think like that kind of raises the question of what can we do with academia now? Because like if we want this, like we obviously need this collective thought that is non-hierarchical to continue. But then I'm also like a bit wary of being like, let's give up on universities. Yeah, but I mean, I think there's a, there's a really important, um, like, I don't know, maybe his flavour of, of communism is, is perhaps this particular thought that is anyone can talk about politics, anyone can talk about society that they may want to develop, anyone can talk about um, how they feel about shit that's going on. Like, it's, it's, you know, it's completely, it should be democratic. And if you yeah. only hear the certain opinions or, you know, formulations of how society is working from very specific groups, um, you know, I'll, I'll be them pr privileged or not, but if you don't have a, a wide spectrum, if you don't have a loud voice coming from all these different places, then it it falls in on itself and does become a bit, you know, one dimensional. Yeah, and I think like that is the problem facing particularly philosophy departments, because all the critical theory has been shoved into the literature departments and there are great work being done in like literature departments that are like critical theory and like our philosophy, like their philosophical work. And then it's just like, and then you go to a philosophy department and it's like five people who work on logic. And it's just like, I mean, sure, logic's necessary, I think. Um, so yeah, <laughs> sorry, this definitely ended up in a rant. <laughs> no, it's all good. Yeah. It's like my, my, my dad's best friend is a quantum physicist and, you know, he's always acknowledged like he spends half his paycheck just sitting there because he gets paid. <laughs> yeah, and then it's like, <laughs> and he loves it. It's yeah. like, and it's a bit of like capitalist realism. <laughs> like, I think when we talk about institutions, it's like his point is that like the bureau, bureaucratic sizeization that's close enough to the word that all of you know oh, what I, I mean. I can't think of it that either. <laughs> <laughs> and there, it's like, it's, it's like bureaucracy and like the in, endless bureaucracy of like work in this point where it's like the conditions of work is being made to be like, you do work about work. Yeah. And it's like, I mean, it's the like David Gray, the bullshit jobs, jobs point. Yeah. Um, but like, and I think like he's really on top of that. It's just like part of the reason why like that is like, in the way at the moment is like the conditions of work are so abysmal and i think like fisher like in capitalist realism like i think it was always coming but like he really nails that like the gig workforce is going to be the primary workforce and it's obviously the one that we live in now well at least like everyone works as a casual and then you have no rights you have like, zero hour contracts yeah and it's just like it is the state of work itself that and then it's like you need a union, but also there's not much a union can do when it's the literal foundations. And it's just like, I mean, there's already a problem with unions not recognizing casual workers properly, mm. or like having them involved in the boards. Of Except randomly in China now, because the Uber drivers, not Uber, but the other ones that they have, they, they've no unions. Do you know that? No, I didn't. Yeah. Do you want yeah. to say that's out of Oh, sure. There's the, um, <laughs> like food delivery, there's a food delivery union now in China. I, just, I think that's cool. <laughs> that is cool. It is cool. <laughs> but then, like, I think it also gets to the point, I think, why I like asset communism so much is reading it now and reading it during the pandemic when obviously it's been the mass crisis of, like, individualization, like, being forced upon you and then failing. And, and isolation and being alone and being online. Yeah. Like, oh. Yeah. Um, and then it's just like, we've obviously seen that like the things that work during this and mutual aid networks, as opposed to a government structure, where it's like it's people relying on the, each other and the collective. But then there's also like the problem of like, like obviously we're in a mass wave of Omicron now. But I think, I, I mean, I think, you know, something that definitely came out for me anyway, whilst reading um, Capitalist Realism and it's um, like Britain is, I don't know, like uh, in, so, in some ways, definitely with the NHS doing a lot fucking better than here. Um, and the fact that you need a job so that you can pay for your private health care, that you can have blah, blah, blah. Like Australia is fucking bullshit with medical stuff. Um, you know, not as bad as the States, but whatever. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, the, 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 the point of uh, growing up 
um, you know, and 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 from from having squatted for fucking ten years, <laughs> and and you know, being very recent to like adulting, um, <laughs> it's you know the the point of of having a, a job that you can uh, you know put down on online, and then having sort of like health benefits that come with that because it's cheaper, like from one way or the other to you know pay your taxes, this kind of thing. Um, I think the 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 fact that there is a social welfare state was um, when he was growing up was very important to him, and you know the fact that the the competitivism of a market doesn't matter so much if a, a GP will be paid irrelevantly, um, you know, working within the NHS or something to treat their patients. Like it, it, it's not just a you know shark situation. Um, like and these situations uh, lead to the ability for people to be more experimental, to be have have time for creative projects, to have time for um, you know doing things that are uh, communally bonding and and not just pursuit of their own you know work hard play hard bullshit um which 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 is that very capitalist yeah. individualized yeah but like at the same time like there's an interview with um zoe fisher mark fisher's wife yeah. after he died and her point is that because the medical student system was shifting to a telehealth system as opposed to an in-person thing like the treatment stopped being effective yeah. because like you're distanced and you can't engage properly yeah. and like it just allows for like people to like slip, slip off. Yeah. yeah. And it's like, and obviously like, like telehealth is now the predominant way that medical service within Australia, particularly. I'm sure yeah. in the UK as well. Um, like, I mean, yes, no, but yeah. um, I mean, it, it, in so many things that like, I mean, health is one thing, but like university, you know, yeah. like, <laughs> you know, like studying, having uh, like, I mean, anyone that's ever studied, in any sense like if you went to primary school you kind of get it like seriously you know you're, you're around your classmates you're around a group of other people you go through experiences and you go through progressions with them and you recognize that you're having this collective experience of like hating algebra or whatever <laughs> um, and 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 that's a you know it's a bonding experience also because you're uh forced into a lot of time with people um and so then you therefore build connections and relationships and all of this and it's very hard to do if you're now on a zoom university for life and then people don't need to necessarily move here or there or meet up or have you know passing conversations about that guy gave me a dirty look or whatever i don't know it's 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 um it's not inhuman all too human perhaps you could say <laughs> but uh it's 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 just you know it's, it's not something that i think anyone in their right mind would actively choose to do university from zoom like you just you wouldn't <laughs> i think um and it's the basic like you know lineal progression of capitalism is zoom yeah I mean, that's why you've got your, you know, what is Zoomers, Doomers, this, this stuff. <laughs> These are all like e epoch words for generations. I'm not, I'll, I'll leave it there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's interesting because, like, maybe this is just me, like, returning to the acid communism stuff. It's just like, and me just, it's like, I explicitly reject the thesis that, um, like, Mark is a Doomer. Or, like, is. Mm -mm. Yeah, I'm not saying you do, but like I think it's worth discussing is that um, for preparation for this, I read some like pretty terrible essays about Mark Fisher online. Some hating. Well, no, it was like there's one person who was just like his Marxist analysis isn't like good enough. And I was just like, and you're the gatekeeper of Marxism now, <laughs> man on the blog. Mm -hmm. um, but like it was just really interesting to like read. And like, and they're just like, this, everything is like negative. He's got no positive project. And I think like, maybe if you read like capitalist realism, you, I think there is a positive project in capitalist realism. That's basically just, we need to stop the, we need to like, stop the fucking car. Mm. And like, I, that is a positive project. That is a, let's fucking get it. But I think, I think his, his, his project yeah. were there to be one um, and, and not being specifically, you know, directionally focused at like, you know, let's end the monarchy for instance like as a specific specific 
you know, outcome. <laughs> um, Queen is dead, though. <laughs> she's been dead for a long time. Um, <laughs> but I think it's, you know, like his, his, like, desire is that people get together and they discuss and they find interesting um, ways ar around and then through the, the issues that they, they have, which don't need to be the same and you don't need to have uh, even necessarily like an ideological footing in the same fucking arena, but that you can have an understanding for your common person as a, as a fellow, as a comrade, however you maybe choose to interpret that, that's transcending individualism yeah. as an isolated and, and, and very therefore like inertly regressive blob I don't know. <laughs> but I, I think I think that it's it's like it's a swan song like his whole work career you know it's it, in in some senses and maybe that's like very dark of me to say but uh, I feel like it's you know he he has a and, and anyone that's ever really read him he has a very 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 good eye for what's going on and and being able to describe it visually and 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 beautifully and it's not necessarily that uh he's picking things up off the floor and, and building something out of it and going there this is what you can do you know um and it, you know like it, it didn't it didn't end well for him um which i don't think has anything to do with his theory but it's his his theory could be seen as as a reflection of all the things that he you know wanted but couldn't maybe achieve within himself uh, as the you know because he, he felt isolated because of the the problems that he brings up like he's so hyper aware he's very intelligent and he's very aware and like that's the, that's yeah. the struggle I mean that's like you can be less aware and happier ignorance is bliss type you know yeah I mean that's the basic um like thesis of the it's a very famous um k punk blog post it's called good for nothing mm. which is his most personal description of depression and it's just like depression is the feeling of being good for nothing that's like and that's just the position that you have of yourself that like whatever you produce will not only like it comes off bad like people think badly of you but also like you give them something bad and it's that, like, double-edged thing that always fights it. But, like, the really interesting thing about that is, like, is and with all of these work, particularly made about aspect mental illness, is that, and I think it's, like, another one of those things that I think there's, like, what Mark Fisher actually says about it and then the weird internet version of it, which is, like, falls into, like, identity politics, is that, it's like, your mental health is, like, caused by your environment. And, like, it's no wonder all these people are so depressed and so anxious and... Like, it's because we live in this, like, hyper-individualist. And, like, that identification, I think, is really key. And, like, and just the accuracy that he has of it. And it's just, I don't know. I, just... I mean, I think um, what's worth um, maybe mentioning and then also kind of, like, feeds into our other, like, point subject area is like you know he's he's very um very aware and people often um you know especially if you, you look on the internet um you know there's very like huge amount of uh you know youtube videos or, or podcasts or things like this um you know of, of american theorist students whatever that's that's fine that's valid you can appreciate anyone from anywhere in the world but he was he was he was very specifically writing about a time and a place which he lived through which was his experience and you know, he, he does speak about, um, you know, capitalism, which is obviously not something unique to Britain. He does speak about a lot of things that aren't unique to Britain, but he's speaking about them from a personal context, from a context that is British and having lived from here and there in this place and that. And, and it's something to um, take stock of because the, the specificity um, in which you could, you know, like, understand um like the the nuances in sort of like post rave culture of like you know a burial album if you've not been in britain and you've not been maybe in any kind of rave situation and you don't understand a lot of the you know musical samples that come up in that it's it, it is actually something that you won't be haunted by in quite the same way you won't be like oh fuck, that's a tesco belt you know, and no, but it's it's simple things like that. And he's 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 very um, 
I think, uh, upfront about like, this is my theory about my world, not necessarily making these grand sweeping statements that he often therefore can, you know, be uh, accused of, like, you know, he, he doesn't talk much about like, uh, you know, African American hip hop, no, why should he? In some ways, it's not his musical, you know, over it's, it's, um, it's, it's easy to tear someone down on the, you know, universalist principle of, of, and, you know, he is a very smart person that does speak about many, many, many different things, but he's, he's very direct to, uh, you know, be the first person to point out that everything, and, and, you know, he said to himself, I mean, I can't remember what book, but, you know, like that, the whole like personal political thing for him, like more like the political is personal, I think would be more his, his, his taking on it instead of the other way around, you know, it comes back to the self, the one. Yeah, because there's like no division in the first place. Mm -hmm. Like, so that's like the fundamental thing. And it's why I think like, Mark Fisher has like a real affinity with like a lot of like, why I think he's affinity with Heidegger in that like the basic premise of being in the world is that of like you are, like you are a being already in the world, you are defined by the world you are in. And that is like the exact, it is so similar that like you can bring the theses together. Oh. Um, um, I think that did you want to talk about um postcolonial depression? Oh, oh wait, how, where, how are we doing for time? Um, that is. <laughs> um, no, I mean maybe we can maybe we can just like open that up in general. Like we we had a bit to say on a bit like um because what I when I, when I brought that up and I was talking to you, what I wanted to say about it was more like. You know, um, a lot a lot of the stuff that he wrote obviously has um, a timestamp on it because he was writing about a very specific epoch and, and, and things. He's also uh, talking about the maybe decline of all epochs, but like how do we perhaps as like Australians now living in Melbourne, which is a very, very, very different culture in a lot of important ways uh, to London. Um, how, how do we and why should we be interested in his his theories at all or be um you know receptive to to the, the the things that he's thinking and i think um i can't remember what but we talked about the other day um but he has uh because he has like three three theories on depression and post-colonial is, is one of them but he doesn't go into it too much but it would obviously be a very different thing here than it would be in the uk yeah because i mean i just think about um, in The Weed in the Ear, he has an essay on a naked hanging rock. Oh. Um, and it's just, and like um, in like, there's very little secondary literature on Mark Fisher. There's the primary book is called Egress by Matt Colquhoun. I don't know how to pronounce that. <laughs> um, I'm sure if you Google Egress Mark Fisher, it will come up. But, um, and his point is that like, he's talking about the debate about um, picnic hanging rock, and he's like, the argument is that in Fisher's analysis, he misses like the like how like indigeneity is like mystified to the colonial, and that the film betrays that. Whereas like I think that misses Fisher's point in so far as that like I just think about in the movie at least the like shot of Hanging Rock and the shot of the school are these huge like stone monoliths, and it's equally that like like and then like it's just like the colonial like girls like. Don't like there's a thing of like not belonging, and like it's a particular thing alienated from the thing, and that's why like the school mistress goes fucking insane because she's trying to create a like England in like Mount Macedon, which is an yeah, insane. Yeah, but also trying to create a society out of like women, yeah, who are all got other shit going on elsewhere. Yeah, <laughs> and then like because he talks about um, there's like a. In the book, Picnic Hanging a Rock, there's like the final chapter got cut from the original one, but it's like basically it implies that the girls just kind of like crawl into a portal in the middle of the rock. Um, but it also implies that the so like um, the girl who is found like, like 10 days later on the rock is that she hesitates and the, like the like portal closes, but she desperately tries to get in. And like that's why her hands are covered in scratches is because she's trying really desperately. And it's this thing about like, like not like well, this is a weird kind of thing of just like the two girls who go are kind of weirdly accepting of the fact they don't belong there so they go through the portal but then it's just like the other two like the really annoying one and the other one um 
But that is the plot if you can hang out. There's no really hang out. Like that scene where they scream at each other. It's the... <laughs> It's horrible. It's that... horrible. Yeah. But like, I don't know. This is me. Tempted to scream at you. Please don't. I won't. Um, how much I like the King Henry Rock. But I found that analysis really interesting. So I think that's Fisher's point is that like there is always going to be like an alienation in like the violence of the post colonial struggle. Mm. And it's like, it's almost like saying that it's whether like post of the colonial becomes very questionable, right? Sure. But I mean, this is also the exact kind of criticism that he was uh, like critiquing in in the vampire castle and it's just like yeah okay you could look at it that way like oh, miss some shit oh, you some holes in your argument here oh, oh, oh. it's like okay cool did you make a good film no um and then also you know the the other very beautiful very magically enchanted way of looking at it is that they, those girls were fucking hyper aware and that's why they went through yeah and it, i also <laughs> you know, think like, like it's <laughs> the interesting thing and i think like Maybe this, I think this should be our last point before we open the questions, but like, um, is the thing I really like about Fisher is that, like, how he does his philosophical and cultural analysis on the same plane. And I think, mm. and that's because he has the point about creator things. And like, it goes back to the point of acid communism is that, like, and why he writes so much about like science fiction, particularly, or just yeah. like these things is that, like, it's that point of imagination that allows for like a slight wiggling of thought. You can take the, like, historical situation you're in and then be like what if I change this one tiny little thing or what if I do this with this and it's like and it's just like that like plasticity mm. I think that's the word um, plasticity that's not yeah. um, <laughs> that's enunciating um <laughs> thought is like what is absolutely necessary for us like for acid communism and for just like a way of thinking about things and it's the like weird like lack of creativity in capitalism that like if you're an individual you can produce things but it's like it's specifically like the production that i think you talked about and so translation in the future you just like mm. kind of make shit yeah the market yeah and 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 also like you know you stand on that alone you stand yeah. on what you do what you make uh how you consume who you consume <laughs> whatever <laughs> um and it's uh, in a way, it's like less um, interesting than a, any kind of mass mobilization. Um, you know, oh yeah, no, because I wanted to, I wanted to, anyone can like bring this up, but no, I was going to say for Australia within the specific context of, of Melbourne, that like you know these 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 protests that we had last year, this kind of thing, um, which has already gotten like even like halfway when they were there you know people are trying to say not everyone there was a tradie or who cares it's like they took over a bridge like there's a magical <laughs> moment there <laughs> who cares like you know like you can think down like cold hard lines of, of correctness or you can see movement and energy and and communal gathering and then you know do something with that because fundamentally that I think will be more important than, um, you know, if there there were maybe say say like forty Nazis there. Okay, <laughs> like does that mean that everyone there is tarnished and therefore unworthy? It seems like you're posing a question. To I you. am posing like a question I have to make a definitive answer. <laughs> well, like I think like the obvious answer to that is no. Well, because it's just like, I think, like, and that's the fundamental thing is that, like, but you're looking at the wrong thing if you start asking those questions anyway. Yeah. Because it's like, there's people singing on a bridge. It's never happened in Melbourne forever. And maybe it will happen all the time and maybe it will never happen again. And it's it's just more of a. Well, XR do a lot of singing on bridges. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. No offense. Ten. No, yeah, um, but like, I mean, it's just, I think, like, oh, I get what you mean. Like, there's a very big difference between XR and the um protest last year i think that's an obvious statement but i feel like i should make it we're not quiting them at all no 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 I'm in any way. no but i'm just saying there's a way of looking at things that are going on around you in which that was if nothing else um it was a lot of energy it was more energy than australia often has in terms of like political um frustration than, than I than I personally have ever seen or that I personally know of. Um, and it's it's recognizing currents 
um, of, of, of energy and, and that can be in so many different things, you know, like depression is a certain type of energy, frustration is another type of energy, um, acceptance is another type of energy and, you know, a lot of the, if you've ever heard him speak, um, he's a fucking energetic little guy <laughs> and, you know, like he'll dance around the room. Um, he'll make points and he'll, he'll he, you know, engage with you in this way that's like they're um, just as, as a person I think he had an intense amount of energy and I think a lot of the things that he thought and felt and you know people um, friends of mine that have studied with him that you know they leave his classes always been like <laughs> as opposed to like oh, fuck, I've got stuff to do or thinking of something else like you, you don't because you've got this really energetic passionate um, engagement with what's going on around you. And it's not like you have to say something positive all the time about things going on around you. Most of the stuff I think you could largely say that he ever said was probably a criticism, but he's arguing passionately about stuff that he cares about that he sees, which is why I bring up like, I don't know, the protest in a way, because it's like, well, what's, what is, you know, the, the point of us, um, you know, adopting forms of um, mass consciousness. What if they all go horribly wrong? What if everybody's a fucking asshole? Like, who knows? Like, it's, it's very complicated, but it's um, uh, more interesting to realize where those currents lie, perhaps, than trying to uh, squish people's arguments. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> I think mean, that's a good. <laughs> to end the conversation, I okay. think. And um, I think we should open it up. Um, I'm going to work out what's going on with my laptop because yeah. there are some glitchy lines. I'll do this. You can open it up. Um, but yeah, if anyone in the room has anything they would like to bring up or like just, I don't know, like Shout. questions, <laughs> like accuse us of being terrible human interpreters and Mark Fisher. <laughs> Now's your chance. Now's, tell us what intellectual thoughts. Well, tell me. Alex is not, but I definitely am. <laughs> um, yeah, on the point that you're making about the protest, the struggle thought that helps me up up is a normal thing to me. Yeah. If you just repeat the question for the people at home. Yeah. yeah we'll um, if you're saying we're interested, I'm uh, trying to put it all together in like diagnosing um, potency and like mass collection, mass collective kind of. And I feel like that's an example of what you could see in that. Whereas, um, like his overarching or one of his overarching um, attempts is also kind of bits and intricacy, you know, um, relay with Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll just like, I mean, like the, the London riots was another kind of example of that. It was fucking intense, you know, and I was living in some rough areas and you wouldn't just be like, oh, I'm on the street, but, but you have this energy, a piece of litter crawls down the street and you're like, oh, like, you know, it's, 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 it's visceral. And it, it is that, that, you know, collective, collective energy that can be good, can be bad, can be all kinds of things. Um, ideally, it should be good. <laughs> um, but I, I think it's, um, you know, oh, should we have to repeat the question? Repeat the question, Lucy. Um, <laughs> and I think the, the basic like, question, please correct me if I'm wrong. Sorry, I was half paying attention to the tech stuff. I feel really bad. But um, it was the idea of like the relationship between the cultural products and the political no, but, but also like a sort of downer culture of, 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 of general malaise, depression kind of yeah. thing you were talking and about, yeah? Like, because of that little question on what, what was his overarching goal by who was so politically kind of um, MP, what, what is his target then? I feel like that was one of his main targets was to show what the kind of psychological experience that yeah. he had before to do in the past. 
how that makes us as um, See, I, I don't, I don't, I don't personally, I, I think Lucy probably agree with me. I don't think he's politically like, you know, soft or disinterested at, at all. But um, he's he's not um, and has been criticised by uh, you know other colleagues and academics on the left for, for not being like communist enough, yeah. for not being um, hardlined about like this is what I want, these are my demands, yeah. you know, this is how I think society will go forward. Um, uh, is is more. So uh, you said that being said, I do agree with the criticism that like Jody Dean has not of Mark Fisher particularly, but of this general like disengage like this like fear that the like left has of using particular language and like I do understand why people older than me probably like will shy away from calling themselves a communist or like calling them like and using the term comrade or like stuff like that yeah. but then like I think it like my like problem I have with that is that it ignores the, like the history of like why I read that quote was that like capitalism is like created in opposition to like the communal and yes. then like communism like specifically specifically, specifically. was yeah, meant yeah. to like was this embodiment of it and like obviously like the USSR not the best but like still like the propaganda that the US made which is how we understand capitalism now was created in this fake idea they made of it which was ultimately to deny the communal at yeah. all and to create the neoliberal project of this hyper individualized atomized individual um I think I mean something also like so like I agree with that criticism when he shies away from that language because I'm just like go full out, call yourself like a communist, call yourself say comrade. I don't think that like I think like I don't know. I just feel like why not? Well, yeah, I mean I don't I know that's, that's how you think. Um, <laughs> um, I don't know. I'm an anarchist. That's funny. <laughs> but um, I I think I think as well. Uh, you know, if if you were to like put him in um any strand of philosophy we're talking about the other day we're probably i don't know like a fucking nouveau frankfurt school it's like second gen frankfurt school but it's um you know something that also came up a lot uh for them um you know that the, the whole like you know there is no alternative to the, the, the setting which uh, is often very fucking gloomy <laughs> unbelievably gloomy um and Sorry. <laughs> I mean, yeah, like no one's going to accuse Adorno of being an optimist. No, no, no. He's a bitter, cynical, bitter, cynical man. But, but for, for, you know, for very um, good reasons. Yeah. Um, for, I mean, I also do feel like it's really interesting when you take like Adorno and he's writing about art. Yeah. Like, because he, I mean, like, I think like. How much abstract art do we need? <laughs> yeah. Because I'm just like, I mean, that is a point of innovation. That is very similar to the point Fisher makes. I mean, like. Fisher makes criticism of Adorno, sorry to anyone who doesn't care about the serious shit, is that like Adorno relies too much on the distinction between high and low art, oh. which is like a fairly glaring thing in Adorno's work is that, and then like, I mean, like I'm, I don't know. Um, but like, it's also for instance, like let's say just like taking the character of Adorno, like he's a German Jew who got expelled or exiled himself um and then went to america and you know had the realization that it's all kind of the same which is like how depressing could that be in in the sense maybe of, of like mass media control yeah um and i also think there's like a super interesting parallel sorry i kind of interrupted you there ooh. between um mark fisher and walter benjamin or walter benjamin benjamin however <laughs> Um, Malta. <laughs> yeah, who's like, I mean, like, first of all, life trajectories upsettingly similar. Similar, yeah. Um, I mean, obviously, like, a lot of Benjamin stuff came from being persecuted as a Jew, but then just like the whole. And then, yeah, being able, in, in, unable to escape. Yeah. But then, yeah, and just like the weird tragedy of his life and that, like, he could have maybe, like, the bar, like, in that kind of stuff. But then, anyway. But, and I think that's like interesting because like Benjamin also like focuses a lot on like, I mean, he has like the weird diaries where he and his friend, is it Bethel Brecht? Brecht? Brecht. The playwright? I think so. There's one of his friends and like, they do this like cool experiment where they both like, they take psychedelics and they write down all their experiment, like experiences. That was not Brecht. Okay. <laughs> 
there's some theorist well, like a player <laughs> or something that was like um, like and they just like kind of do a shit ton of drugs and they compare their experiences and it's just like it's like trying to work out what is the communal engagement with the world yeah and i think like I think that's like the basis of Fisher stuff as well. Yeah, like, but, but I, I mean that that is his point on 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 depression though is that it's like it's not just you, like it's not your fault, it's not your problem. It's a very large, very distinct, very communal <laughs> problem that you're often you, not you, sorry, but you know what I mean. You anyone <laughs> is is told is you know you're not working hard enough, you're not doing the right things, you haven't made the right choices, you're not a good enough person. Um, and it has largely more systemic uh, and and meta uh, reasons for being ontologies, you know, um, as opposed to your crap. <laughs> <laughs> um, which I, th I think a lot of his feelings and thinking about depression is that that people often feel very isolated with that feeling, and they feel very, um, uh, you know, failed. Um, but that it's something that is maybe so common um, and you know specifically even like I mean I'm, I'm a young person now and um, <laughs> it's like I can understand and hear my parents and you know older people talking about their childhoods or whatever but I feel like I fucking know so many depressed people and I don't feel like my parents had that experience I really I genuinely just don't um, or if they did, maybe they didn't talk about it so much, but like part of the, the, the recognition um, of, of having those, those feelings or whatever is part of his project of like yeah, communal consciousness, communal um, requiem, I don't know if there was a hand. Yeah, um, so Valentin asked, asked the question, how does Fisher engage with the relation between the economy and the social effects it has? Um, which I would just say he's entirely like the work he does on the concept of work would be the most obvious like thing of that yeah. insofar as that like capital needs like the mass needs like capitalism needs to always create capital above all else and like obviously capital needs to be understood as like like profit for profit's sake it's beyond like meeting your needs it's just like accumulation of wealth that you put away and then like either you like you invest it so you do like speculative capital so you make just like guesses and then you pretend you have all this money well you do have all this money like in fact but like it's all fake do i do i money is fake and that's the hot take that you're getting tonight um i think i, I mean i, I think i had this <coughs> engaged with the relation between the economy and the social yeah economy. i mean within that i mean maybe more like uh specific to like my interest in fisher but like um you know, he makes it very, very, very explicit within the slow time solution of the future that people are like, oh, this worked out. I'm going to make art like that. I'm going to be that kind of person because that seems commercially viable. Or I'm going to um, have a fucking tribute band because people seem to fucking love the Arctic Monkeys. My God. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, but, but it is selling within that as opposed to like being like, oh, okay, you know, this is how I play guitar or whatever. Yeah. I mean, there's also like the point that like capitalist realism, I think it was published in 2009, maybe 2010, and it's directly in relation to the global financial crisis. Mm, mm. Um, very much so. And it's just like, because the global financial crisis was just like this huge, huge catastrophe. This huge, and like it wasn't catastrophe, it was a fuck up. And, and to be fair, like as someone that like literally moved to England the next year, um, it, you know like we didn't have it nothing like they did it was it was yeah. it was you know it was apparent um it was apparent to anyone that you talk to and as, as I said from my own personal that you know I was um like GFC riots 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 <laughs> like it was this few years of fucking chaos that were very intense very mass mobilization very um you know civil, civil unrest uh which is you know like that's economic on that scale, like having people living at St. Paul's for six months, like, you know, and then taking over the bank over the road. Like, that's not, that's not great for business. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. And then also, I think like it um, feeds into like what, happened, like the, how the, this is probably a particularly American example, but I think it applies is that like the government's just codified it. They're just like, oh, cool, you lost billions of dollars, you've ruined millions of people's lives. Oh. Here's some more money. Yeah, and 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 fix yourselves. And people weren't like people. People are not um, like we. We've. It seems to me like when I talk um, maybe to 
more so like maybe the generation slightly half a little bit older than me or something but it's like you know people that have had those mortgages had that shit going on at the time that it is it is particularly rough and it's like you know the in in the 80s you know economics was this sexy powerful force <laughs> which has come hurtling down hard and fast um and people people aren't stupid like mass people they're not stupid like and i mean again maybe i'll link to the protests again like they're not stupid and to to say you're all fascists you're all assholes you're all idiots you're all working class like whatever you want to throw at them um you know not, none of these things are justified or fair and when you see like you know for instance in the london riots like you know these are people who have really fucking hurt over global economies london being the center of it really 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 hurt rebelling and 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 showing their frustration and their anger at the system that clearly oppresses them you know and it was yes largely also in you know like really really low income areas that kind of thing but um you know i think i think fisher engages with all of this like quite beautifully yeah actually in the sense that he's not trying to necessarily dictate to anyone what you should do but telling you to like stay up late and talk to lots of people and hang out with people. And that's the only way that you're ever really going to achieve anything. Um, we have another question in the Zoom chat um, that's directed at Lisa. I'm not sure which one of us that is. Um, you mentioned that Fisher. Lucy. <laughs> <It's> Lucy. <laughs> we both self described um, Fisher as a communist. So it could be directed either at both of us. But, um, you mentioned that Fisher is self-described as a communist. How should we situate his thought in the tradition of Marxism, i.e. his legacy influences and developments? Okay, well, Marxism is not necessarily communism. Could be. There's a yeah. lot of debate on that in by itself. <laughs> um, Lisa, take it away. <laughs> um, I don't know, like, I think I mean, it's a self-identification. He put himself there for anything else that needs to be said. Yeah, that's not. But then it's like, like me defending that, like. Yeah, okay, defend it. <laughs> well, my, I feel like the quote I read from Russell Communism I mean, is a pretty obvious reason why is it. Oh. There was a tweet that I saw today. Um, good stuff. That was like, oh, like <laughs> communism isn't really about economics; it's about making friends. And I think, Ooh. or it's about friendship and like and having proper engagements with people. You mean I, I can't be friends with money? <laughs> no. <laughs> Why? But like, I think, like, I don't like fully describe to that as like a thing, but I think it's an interesting way of thinking about it is that my understanding of communism, it's about the relate, like the relation you have with other people. And like, maybe it's because like, I go a bit Bolshevik and be like, Soviets are pretty cool. But like, <laughs> um, that was real, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Well, like, like um, that's where my inclination lies. It's like it's the communal is the space in which the non hierarchical space is the obvious. And I think Fisher is always looking for that in his work. And it comes yeah, up in yeah, his yeah. access, like, work, like making his work accessible, like his just engagements with like starting his, his own publishing company so they could publish people that wouldn't be accepted by the academy. He's like the modern equivalent of the Salon de Refusé, <laughs> you could say. True. <laughs> Um, no, but, uh, so for me, like, you know, the, the sense of any kind of communism is getting on mass with people that you don't agree with and you necessarily don't like, you know, it's, it's, and, you know, I know, like from my personal experience of squatting, it's like, you know, one girl I lived with, she burnt my house down. Um, like, she, there's fucking, people are crazy. But the, the idea that you live together anyway is like, you know, partly because some people don't have anywhere else to live, partly because some people are like, they don't want to live within the paying rent and bullshit crap system. Other people, you know, like most of my friends were Eastern European and, um, you know, like their lives back home and the potential things that they could uh, maybe achieve were like slower and more difficult and they came, you know, as, to London as economic migrants um, or, you know, ideological migrants. Um, and it's, uh just I, I i don't necessarily see that communism means that you're friends no no but you have a respect for people as 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 a living being like you don't you don't have to fucking you know 
having round to like stroke your mother's hair or anything you know, <laughs> that you, you respect your fellow man and it's it's more important to get along with people that you don't necessarily agree with um that you maybe have those differences and then still have this common objective that's more what 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 that's about and i think when you look at a lot of um you know the things that um fish is sort of gearing towards um i mean again i'll maybe put it in in, in the, the reference of art but it's like what's such a downer about um recycling um old art forms and and not progressing on that is because you're and I, he says it somewhere i have no idea where um but you're, you're kind of smothering the the uh potentiality of new people who might have you know divergent things things to say and think and whether or not they're good things to think and say is not for um him to you know predict or anything but it's the fact that the you know when you're really really comfortable i mean and anyone knows this like you you know you hang out with your best friend and you can't wait to tell them all this stuff and you start talking and you're like blah, 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 and it's like stuff that you wouldn't say to other people and when you're in a comfortable situation that's that's how you interact with the world you, you can sometimes say things that maybe just popped into your head or, or whatever and it's it's this kind of security which you know depression often is is that muzzle is that like i shouldn't speak i'm not worth to speak it's it's i don't want to have um the you know pressure put on like it, it can be very very intense in that way of like i'm not good enough um but if you lived in a supportive environment a commune perhaps um, you, you would Sorry. be you would be good enough maybe. <laughs> um, are there any more questions? This is open to both people in Zoom. Hello, and um, just weird, they're right there. Um, have anyone in the room? Is there any like points you want to raise or anything? Do you want to throw one of Terry's questions at us? <laughs> there was like yes. forty. <laughs> um, so Terry is a member of the Nibs Book Club, which are in this lull. I'll promote Nibs as a book club. I run it. It's, it's as coherent as you Great. probably expect. <laughs> um, yeah, we're starting up again soon. We're reading Jodie Dean's Communist Horizon is our first book. I'm Friday very... mornings? Friday mornings, yeah. I'll just scroll and pick <laughs> Yeah, um, and so Terry is a member of the book club and you send us questions in advance of time. Um, we read Capital's Realism last year. It was like the first book when I took over the book club that we read and it wasn't my choice, it was foisted upon me. Because <laughs> everyone's like, you talk about this a lot, so <laughs> let's read it. Um, I don't know. I don't know where to choose. There's a final ruminations. Are they questions or ruminations? Oh, good point. This is a lot. Um... Well, I think from memory, ter what well, um, Terry's main criticism is Terry is a like academic anthropologist, and I think like the me methodology question is the interesting one at least. There's like the collection of data. I don't know. It's I'm really okay, sorry, okay. Terry. There's one here that just appeals to me. Okay. Um, I hope I hope it's all right with you, Terry. Um, defending noble self-sacrifice, the strategy that plays into the hand of control freaks. <laughs> I just sort of like fruits. But... <laughs> Can you repeat the statement, please? <laughs> I think it's a question. <laughs> defending noble sacrifice, a strategy that plays into the hands of control freaks. Question. I don't know. Like, I think well, one part of me is just like, you do have to sacrifice something. Like, yeah. And I mean, sacrifice in this specific sense could be the basic, um, you know, personal capitalist drive of like, I'm going to, you know, spiritually run over my enemies to get ahead type thing. You keep talking. I'm typing. Okay. <laughs> Um, I don't know why I chose it. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, I think, I think the word noble kind of throws me off there, Terry. Um, because I don't necessarily think, um, unless you mean the sacrifice of the self into the collective, um, which you could say is kind of what communism is perhaps but is a very brutal way of thinking about it um, um and and yes is is i think something that fisher obliquely discusses 
in terms of that we should get together and do shit. Yeah, <laughs> and that shit doesn't necessarily have to, like, it can just be, like, hanging out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. but that's the, you know, your own person, like, you could be doing, like, more sit-ups, but you choose to have a beer with your friend. American psycho a bit. That's a question. Yeah. Um, Valentine, can you please type your question? Please. Um, there is a lot in here. Yeah. Yep, Terry, prepare. Oh, there's even more quotes. So there's even more numbers. <laughs> um, there's four A, B, C, and D <laughs> in another section. <laughs> um, Valentin has asked us to, could you explain what individualism is? Um, I guess I should do that as the theory person, right? Please. Okay. <laughs> um, so like individualism in like in Mark Fisher's sense is like the supreme like atomization of you into a consumer. And that's like, I wouldn't even say you're a producer or a worker, you're a consumer. And like, it's the idea that like you exist solely for yourself and for your own like desire drive. And I think maybe that's a thing we kind of left out of this discussion was the conversation about desire and libido and stuff. Cause I'm not fully on, like I'm not fully on top of psychoanalysis. I don't know what you think about it. But like, it's the idea that like, it's like you are so isolated that like, it becomes this like weird, like everything relates back to you. And so the other person, like other people, like they exist, but also as consumers and if you're in competition with them. I don't know, like the way I kind of understand like the paradox in like, well, no, this is me to admit my thesis too much, but um, <laughs> the idea of like, what I see in capitalist realism is this idea that like you are elevated to a subject who is like, righteous you know everything and we see that like the philosophical development of that and have like infinite potential alone yeah alone and like it's you like it's pull yourself up by your bootstraps kind of stuff like it's that it's like that logic and then it's like and because you become so focused on that then you're also good for nothing but consumption you like i think that's like like you can only consume and like you define yourself by your consumption and that's your point before about like whether it's like what movies you like, what, like, how much you like the TV show Friends, like, um, all that kind of stuff. And then it's like those two things, and you become this like solid individual that is completely defined. Um, I think, okay, for me, um, maybe not psychoanalysis, but what's wrong with Freud? <laughs> Big play. Um, but he doesn't believe in multiplicities. Like he straight up doesn't, and that's why he had a falling out with Young, because he's like, I dreamt of fucking, I don't know, 12 skulls. And he was like, No, you dreamt of one, just one. It was just one skull. And he has, um, uh, Young uh, talks a lot about this of, of, of being frustrated with the fact that Freud can't see groups, he can't see collectives, he can't see more than one item reoccurring as a different, um, you know semiotic thing from it just happening once um like he's an individualist thinker because he prefers to think of things in isolated occurrences which i think for a lot of his patients um was the way that he was able to treat them but uh it, you know it's um his inability to feel any kind of collective anything it, you know like he, he's very passionate about his family he's very passionate about his work but he's not very passionate about anything larger than um you know meta understandings of things but in isolated situations like i, I mean that's my personal problem with freud and some others but <laughs> you know like he, he's not he, he wouldn't ever be a communist because he doesn't believe in the, the, you know the deep the deep desires the dreams the, the the things that you think and feel um for him are all singular events happening uh, like in isolated moments one to the next and that's how he interprets things yeah. as opposed to like meta anything yeah. but i also don't know freud very well <laughs> <laughs> <I'm not a laughs> 
can't see the only thing I understand about Freud vaguely is like the, the death drive, which is, I mean, like um, Ray Brassia talks about it. He's got a really interesting um, essay about Adorno and Horkheimer and the Enlightenment and like capital's death drive in that like, I can't remember quite what the point is and it's semi off topic, but like, um, oh, like, well, Fisher makes the point in um, post capitalist desire lectures is that the like the death drive is like the same part of the life, like it's a, directly connected to the life drive. There's no like split between it. Whereas a lot of the time Freud talked about it, he conceives it. That's what I said. He sees everything in this isolated individual. Um, yeah, this is yeah. me relating to something I know about Freud. Sorry. Yeah. Um, he breaks shit up. Yeah. Like he, he dismantles people's personalities. <laughs> I don't like stuff. <laughs> um, are there any final questions? Just offer it to the room or to. Yes? I, um, I don't know if this connects to sure. what's going on, but I'm um, just going back to the um, point of no sacrifice. Um, the, um, just going back to um, where I come from, the 50s, for example. Um, after a big long revolutionary movement during the 60s and the 70s, mm -hmm. is what really picked it up is students deciding uh, within the student movement that, you know what, we're going to integrate within the peasant communities and working class communities in order to pick up the revolutionary movement. And that's what really picked up the Philippine revolutionary movement, as we know. Sorry, today. do you mean for like mass mobilization? Yeah, for, yeah, right. uh, for mass mobilizations and also uh, mass organizations. Yeah, yeah. Right. And I think it goes back. Um, to the point that Amilcar uh, Cabral makes in terms of um, class suicide, for example, in that we don't necessarily see it as a noble sacrifice, but more so as an essentiality uh, within uh, within the revolutionary movement. In that, if you're from the petty bourgeoisie or if you're an intellectual, is that you either dissolve yourself into the working class or the peasant class, or you betray the national liberation movement, or you betray humanity in of itself. So I think. Um, the point of noble sacrifice is that in many parts of the world we don't look at it as a sacrifice quote unquote but more so as an essential part of our survival or an essential part of our progress in society in that we either dissolve ourselves into a certain class of people into a certain um toiling masses or we betray our own humanity or we betray national liberation yeah but i mean i think that you, you could say sorry please correct me if i'm wrong comes down to like a very basic tenant of, of, of communism that's just like, you know, the, the very privileged in the society have this ability to fucking live forever because they can pass this, you know, uh, land or, or things along to their genealogy. They can control people that they own perhaps and then pass it along. Like most people don't have uh, the, the privilege um as you say to to live within that that, that sort of um elite control um and and that's the control over their own lives also which is is not it, it, you know is, yeah. is remarkable um i'll repeat the question but then i'll make oh, sorry. point um is that um well the question the comment um the person the audience was talking about um the philippine student movement in the 60s and 70s or yeah and yeah, and today is that the work that they did was in, like going into like the peasant communities and into um like to, to build up mass. Yeah, yeah, mass. And then like the idea of that process was you dissolved yourself with like your allegiance to the petit, petit bourgeois, or like and in doing so, like you committed to the revolutionary masses, and that in of itself is like is goes beyond like a, the concept of a sacrifice. Mm. So yeah, um, can I just continue uh, for a bit? Because, like, um, yeah, because in the point of academia as well, and I think this is what's missing um, organize, in organizing spaces within Australia is that um, within academia, for example, within the rules of the classrooms, right? Mm -hmm. um, when we had the epiphany, I don't know what epiphany is, I'm just going to <laughs> when the epiphany in the, in the Philippines, um, that you know what, we're going to treat society, a collective society, as a classroom. And that that's why the integration part of the revolutionary movement is very essential in our movement in that we form our theories, we form our thoughts through praxis, and that praxis means actually integrating into the revolutionary masses, mm. right? And I think that's what's missing uh, a lot in, uh, in academia here in, in that, you know, there's that lack of integration, uh, for example, in the 
sorry if I'm going too long, but um, in the, as we talked about before, the protest, the anti-vax protest, for example, um, there wasn't much conversation about where I come from, for example, in the northern suburbs, um, the deep northern suburbs, is that a lot of these people have been neglected by the government for a long time, right? So or have reasons to fear the decision. Oh yes, it's very valid reasons. Yeah. That not many people talked about, and that they are being co-opted by the far right, mm -hmm. right? And mm -hmm. I think the co-optation by the far right is a very much a symptom of, of a weak left. Um, that we we have we can't just absolve ourselves of our responsibility that the far right has co-opted this movement because. <laughs> It's cheap. And yeah, it's, it's, it's such a, you know, like no one was there in the northern suburbs when we were organizing there. No one, none of these intellectuals were there. None, you know what I'm saying? Like, and then what we heard was just um, blaming these people from the lowest socioeconomic areas in Melbourne that why are you anti vex? Why are you um, anti this, anti that? But we should be asking what pushed it to be anti vex so or maybe you know what can i do to, to to get you to vaccinate if that's how you feel like as opposed to victim blaming mm -hmm. in a way which kind of it is um you could say but also fuck academia <laughs> as a response to you <laughs> maybe um we both kind of have that feeling but you know ac academia is not everything and i think you know mark fisher is not an academic he's i i he's not an academic and he he had his blog and he had, uh, as I said, he had a very long time where he, he couldn't get published because people, you know, writing for like, uh, like radical philosophy or something, the general in the UK, like, you know, like no, nobody gets in there. Like, you know, he, he didn't, the, the people that get in there are the same people. And then the, the radical thoughts that they have, are, you know, very systemic, very logical, very um, constrained and, yeah. and, and uh, quite abstract. Yeah, and there's a whole thing about like particularly- It's not real. Columbia at the moment, the academics who are proudly happy to like ignore like the strikes happening like the yeah. Purdue scholar is just like <laughs> I don't give a shit about strikes and I'm like how are you a Purdue scholar yeah what did you miss in Purdue um but also I think the point the words <laughs> but the point I would is just like I think it's like this real latching on to the concept of the individual as this aspirational thing and it's like when you take away all else you take away any class structure anything that it's like the one thing capitalism offers you is this individual and you can be like okay I have control over this and like, I think sometimes it's like, that is the, that's the illusion, right? Cause like, you, first of all, it's like, it's fake. You don't exist as an individual separate from everyone else. And no, also, unless, unless you're, and, and then he, I think Mark Fisher uh, talks about this very explicitly. And this is part of his depression, part of his thing, like as a trauma response, you know, fight or flight, you fight for yourself. Somebody's attacking you, you, you know, like if if somebody right now came with, I do love you, but someone came with me for a knife, I'd be like, no, you know, like, that's your, your immediate response, maybe. I'm just saying, but the, the 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 point of that is if you keep people in that constant place of of depression, anxiety, tension, fucking, are you on your phone? Are do you do you need to have a call? Like whatever, like it, you know, um, you're linked all the time to other people that could potentially demand and, and, and control you. That you don't have this 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 ability to 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 calm down, calm yourself down, you know, um. Um, I think that's a good time to finish. Yeah, um, Alex has just gone to <laughs> the bathroom. But, um, thank you so much, everyone, for coming. Um, it's really lovely that you all came here um, to celebrate Mark Fisher. Clearly, he means a lot to Alex and I, and I'm sure he means a lot to you guys as well. Um, thank you to everyone who tuned in on Zoom. Um, I hope the weird thing my computer did didn't affect you guys. Okay, it's fine. Um, but thank you so much. Um, come to Nibs, buy shit from Nibs. Nibs is the best bookshop in Melbourne by far. Fuck all the other ones. <laughs> <laughs>